The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Good evening. Uh, before I start my introduction, uh, let me uh, announce the title and speaker for the next Watson Lecture, which will be on May 7. It'll be Sarah Reisman. Professor Reisman is an assistant professor in the Chemistry and Chemical Engineering Department. And the title of her talk is From Nature to Pharmacy, The Chemistry Behind Modern Medicines. So as the Chair of Caltech's Division of Biology and Biological Engineering, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarkis Masmanian, who is currently a professor of biology in the division. Sarkis received his BS in Microbiology and Molecular Genetics from UCLA in 1995, and his PhD in Microbiology and Immunology in 2002, also from UCLA. After his formal education, Sarkis moved to Harvard Medical School in Boston and spent time there as a research fellow, an instructor in medicine, and even a short stint as an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine before starting at Caltech in 2006. Like much of the research at Caltech, Sarkis's current work cuts across and integrates activity from disparate fields, including immunology, microbiology, and even neurobiology. He is a true innovator and, is, and has pioneered a completely new area of biological investigation that literally has the potential to not only elucidate fundamentally new principles of life, but to transform how we think about the balance of health and disease, healthcare delivery, and even how we develop new drugs. Sarkis has been widely recognized for his work, including a 2008 listing in Discover Magazine of the best brains under 40, and a 2012 half million dollar MacArthur Genius Fellowship. I can honestly say that Sarkis is the only certified genius that I know who includes in his art collection a mural of a colon that he eagerly describes to anyone who will listen. <laughs> the, the title of Sarkis's presentation tonight is Say Hello to Your Little Friends, How Gut Bacteria Can Be Harnessed as Novel Therapies for Disease. Without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Sarkis Vasmanian. Well, thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, hopefully, in the next hour, I'll tell you uh, a little bit about our work and um, the integration between how microbes and microbial molecules uh, interact with the nervous system and the immune system in ways that we think we can harness for health. And um, the story begins on us, on and within us. And so it's become clear over the past 10 years that most, that all humans are, are colonized on almost all environmentally exposed surfaces with bacteria. Te we are all teeming with bacteria. And um, just to put this into some perspective, we all harbor about, about 100 trillion bacteria in our lower gastrointestinal tract, in our colon. And then to give you uh, a, an, an idea of, of the numerical uh, prominence of these organisms, each human is outnumbered by bacteria tenfold. So we are all 90% bacteria on a, on a cellular level and only 10% human. And I think that gives us an appreciation for the magnitude of our interaction with bacteria. And so, um, and, and in addition to the, the total numbers, the different um, species that we harbor are at least 10,000 um, in number. And uh, this number is always growing. So as more and more uh, sequencing data information comes out, it's clear that this, this number will some, someday reach 50,000 or 100,000 different species of bacteria. But each of us harbor a subset of those organisms. And in, in each of us, we harbor about, ten, about 1,000 bacteria, 1,000 different species of bacteria. And so I like to start with this, this piece of information because it really allows us to understand how, how integral microbes are to our biology. And that's gonna be the overlying theme of today's uh, discussion. 
And so you may wonder how we are colonized. And so all of us are born sterile. So to the best of our knowledge, in utero, humans and all mammals are sterile. But uh, during the birthing process, we come in contact with bacteria and initially uh, through the vaginal canal and subsequently um, through life and through contact with humans, as well as um, through the world around us and in fact even animals, we, we assemble this, this consortium of, of 10,000 different species of bacteria. And so um, uh, evidence shows that, that uh, patient or people that are born through cesarean section have a different microbiome than those born through natural childbirth. And I think that that uh, allows us to understand that there, the birthing process is very, very important in the initiation of the program of our, our assembly of our microbes. And so, um, as I mentioned, in, in humans, there are, there are uh, a multitude of organisms. And the same is true in mice. And in fact, all of our research is, uh, is done in mouse models. And the reason why we use mice, for, and it's quite obvious, is that we can manipulate the microbiome, the, the gut bacteria of animals, in ways that are very, very difficult to do in humans. And so this is a picture of our germ-free facility that Caltech generously built us a, a couple of years ago now. And within each of these bubbles are, um, are mouse cages, and each of these cages harbors several um, animals. And so we can, har we can raise about 1,000 animals in this facility. And uh, the air is uh, HEPA filtered in and out. All of the food is autoclaved, and, which means it's sterilized. Um, and so these animals are controlled in their microbial composition. We have animals that are completely microbially sterile. They're reproductively functional, but they're completely microbially sterile. And what this allows us to do is to control what microbes we add, or more importantly, what microbes we don't add. And in fact, we can make mutants of bacteria and then add those to the animals and really understand what are the molecules of the microbes that are interacting with the host, uh, the host itself, whether, once again, whether it's the uh, immune system or the nervous system. So this is a very, very powerful tool. There's only uh, a handful of these, of these uh, facilities around the world. And this really allows us to have some, some very important <coughs> insights into the interactions between our microbiota and mammals. And so over the years, we, we've thought about various different model systems to test some of our hypotheses. And so as I mentioned, we're, we're basic scientists. We work in mouse models. But we'd like to translate our work to, to human disease. And instead of looking uh, simply at how microbes affect the immune system, we, we've chosen the, the path of doing uh, those activities in models of disease. Once again, with a, with a long-term goal of developing some, some of these uh, findings into therapies. And so we've chose uh, a, a model system uh, that mimics inflammatory bowel disease in humans. So inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, is, is um, a spectrum of disorders that's characterized by two main syndromes, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. There's something close to 1.5 million Americans that suffer from inflammatory bowel disease. And so symptoms include constipation, diarrhea, abdominal bleeding, and um, in some cases, very, very severe weight loss. It is, once again, a spectrum, and, and the severity of symptoms do, do vary widely. And unfortunately, uh, the current therapies are either ineffective or have, uh, in some cases, very severe side effects. So this, this uh, disease, which affects many millions of people worldwide, is still a major medical unmet need. But for years, almost 30 years now, people have known that gut bacteria play a role in this disorder. And the evidence for that comes from the fact that antibiotics uh, given either to humans or to animals are known to, to show transient amelioration of disease. And um, unlike the common um, wisdom uh, in terms of how we view bacteria, there is no infectious agent here. And so people have looked for, once again, for many decades at whether or not inflammatory bowel disease is a result of an infection. And once again, there's no signature that, that there's a pathogen or an infectious agent that's involved in inflammatory bowel disease. In, in contrast, what appears to be the case is that IBD results from an inability of, of a subject to tolerate the gut microbes. So I told you there are many thousands of species of bacteria that healthy humans are able to tolerate. We don't reject these organisms the same way we would, we would reject an infectious agent. Whereas patients with IBD seem to have a breakdown in their immune tolerance mechanisms and react as if there was an infection. And it's that reaction that causes the tissue damage and the symptoms that I described. And finally, um, 
in very recent work, it's shown that the profile of the gut bacteria in patients with inflammatory bowel disease seems to be altered compared to, to uh, healthy subjects. So what I mean by that is that when people profile the composition, the community composition of microbes in healthy versus IBD patients, the picture looks quite different. So this is a schematic of the human uh, gastrointestinal tract. And what we're looking at here at the phylum level are bacteria. So once again, I told you there are at least a thousand species of bacteria, but at the higher taxonomic levels at the phylum level, we have two major phyla of, of bacteria, the Bacteroidetes and the Firmicutes. And once again, this is the profile in humans where these two major phyla dominate, but then there are these minor um, species of these minor phyla. In IBD, the picture looks quite different. The landscape is quite altered, where the, uh, the healthy microbiota is reduced, both proportionally and numerically, and some of these minor um, phyla are enhanced. And in fact, these organisms are believed to drive disease, are believed to promote inflammation. And so what that, what that um, allows us to do is to hypothesize that perhaps it's the balance between the organisms that were there the entire time they may mediate diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease. And so in fact, we've termed um, these organisms that drive inflammation, we've termed them pathobionts to, to distinguish them from pathogens or infectious agents, because once again, healthy humans carry these organisms. But if the numbers of these bacteria increase, or if their behavior or their localization changes, then we can tip, then, then what happens is that the balance is tipped towards inflammation and to disease. But conversely, there are beneficial organisms or symbionts, and these are organisms that are protective against inflammatory bowel disease. And our, our belief is that if we can understand the biology of these organisms, then we can harness their, their potential and perhaps um, uh, combat the, the inflammatory processes of pathobionts and, in fact, develop these as pharmaceutical therapies. And so for several years, we've been working with a very unique organism called Bacteroides fragilis. This is an organism that's found in about 20% of the human population. And we started studying this organism because it had very potent immunomodulatory activities. It affected the immune system in very, very unique ways, in ways a decade ago that we didn't quite understand. And so we um, started working with this organism and then realized that there was a specific molecule from this organism called polysaccharide A, or PSA, that had very potent immunomodulatory activity, and in fact, it had anti-inflammatory activity. So this is the, the structure of polysaccharide A, or PSA, so this is one repeating unit. It's a large sugar molecule, it coats the bacteria. These bacteria are stained for PSA, and you can see that it stains the surface of the organism. And this subunit is repeated something close to 100 times. It's a heterogeneous molecule. But it's very unique in terms of its structure and its chemical composition, and I won't discuss that today, but very, very few bacteria have a structure such as PSA. So as I mentioned, we use inflammatory bowel disease or models of inflammatory bowel disease to test whether or not um, microbes affect the immune system. And what we did a few years ago is we set up these animals, animals of inflammatory bowel disease, and we uh, induced the, the disease, and then we treated animals with PSA. And in fact, what we saw in the animals that were induced for inflammatory bowel disease, there was very, very rapid weight loss, and that's shown here. So within, within three days, these animals lose 15% of their body weight. That's quite severe to both an animal and to a human. Um, and these animals have diarrhea and other um, uh, inflammatory processes in their intestines. But if we were to induce the same uh, model, but now treat these animals orally with this polysaccharide, with PSA, as you can see that these animals are generally protected from weight loss. And even more strikingly, if we looked at the tissues, if we looked at the colons of these animals, if you compare a control healthy animal to an animal that was induced for colitis, you can clearly see the inflammation and the, and the tissue thickening in these animals, which looks very, very similar to uh, patients with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And once again, in these animals that were uh, induced for colitis but treated with PSA, as you can see, their colons are quite unremarkable and quite healthy. And so this was quite encouraging at the time. Uh, it allowed us to really um, uh, believe that there was, there was a process here that was beneficial, and then we wanted to understand what the immunologic mechanisms of PSA was. So a short course in, in immunology, I promise I, I won't belabor the point, um, but because immunology can be quite complicated, 
but we have many immune cells that, whose functions are to fight off infections. And in fact, I'm showing you just a subset of those immune cells, and these are cells called T cells. And within T cells, there are various different populations or various different subsets of T cells. And just briefly, of these uh, T cells, there, there are um, T cells that make certain cytokines, such as interferon gamma. These are particular molecules that, um, that, that mark these types of cells. They're called Th1 cells. And these cells are, are, are um, important in fighting off intracellular pathogens. Other subsets of T cells are known as Th2 cells, which fight off extracellular pathogens, and then these Th17 cells. And so what's important to remember is that these are the cells that are our first line of defense against infectious agents, so we need these cells for fighting off uh, pathogens. But the immune system is quite powerful, and, and in fact, many of us are infected with microbes, with infectious microbes on a daily basis, but because we have an immune system, we're able to fight them off. In most cases, we don't even feel uh, their symptoms. But if the, uh, the immune system is not controlled, if the immune system is not regulated, this powerful weaponry, this powerful arsenal, actually leads to, to tissue damage and to disease. So as you can see, Th1 cells and Th17 cells cause autoimmunity, and Th2 cells cause allergy and asthma. And so what uh, is the current thinking in the field is that if T cells aren't regulated, then they cause tissue damage at various different sites, various different locations in our bodies, and that results in the symptoms that, uh, uh, that are associated with many immune diseases, and we'll talk about a few of these, uh, a few of these diseases today. But in the absence of an infection, in healthy people, we have a fourth subset of T cells called regulatory T cells. And these are T cells, they originate from the same um, precursors, but these have the opposite effect. They're immunosuppressive. And what these T cells do, they're called regulatory T cells, and what these T cells do is they prevent Th1, Th2, and Th17 cells from reacting in the absence of an infection. So we wanted to know whether or not PSA worked through regulatory T cells. And in fact, this was a, a, a real paradigm shift at the time because most microbes had been studied as infectious agents. And as you can imagine, microbes subvert the immune system or cripple the immune system so that they can cause an infection. But what we learned is that PSA activates regulatory T cells. It actually co-opts the immune system in a beneficial way to promote the function of these cells and then to prevent the unwanted or uncontrolled uh, inflammation induced by Th1, Th2, and Th17 cells. And to sum up uh, something close to a decade's worth of work in one slide, and I hope that my uh, graduate students and postdocs can bear with me, is, uh, is what we've learned over the years is that there are very powerful organisms living in our intestines that produce uh, defined molecules that are taken up by our immune cells, and this is a cell called a dendritic cell. And what this dendritic cell does is it captures antigens or captures molecules in the intestine and then um, migrates to lymph nodes where immune reactions occur. And then these dendritic cells, which have captured PSA, interact with naive T cells in ways that, that, once again, that we've discovered through various surface molecules and through cytokines that then converts this, this naive T cell to this anti-inflammatory regulatory T cell that I told you about. So this is the evidence that the, uh, for the fact that PSA activates the immune system and engages the immune system in a beneficial way. And as you can imagine, with the buildup of, of regulatory T cells and their increased activity through various molecules that they, that they release, then they suppress Th1, Th17 cells. We haven't tested Th2 cells yet, but clearly this is the pathway by which PSA protects from inflammatory bowel disease and mouse models and our hope is to develop this uh, molecule, PSA, as a therapeutic for inflammatory bowel disease. So I'm showing you the data for IBD. Uh, collaborators of ours have now shown that PSA is also protective in mouse models of multiple sclerosis, which is inflammation in the brain. And the reason why, even though the, the location is different, the reason why this makes sense is that these same cells that I told you about that induce colitis also induce multiple sclerosis in animal models. And MS is a, a neuroinflammatory disease that often leads to symptoms like numbness or paralysis. And so once again, our hope is that PSA would be the first uh, molecule that is derived from the microbiome that we can develop as a pharmaceutical. But conceptually, I think what, what this work tells us is once again, that there's a balance between organisms that are living in our intestine at all times. And if this balance is disturbed, 
then that could be a risk factor for disease. So I told you about um, beneficial organisms, symbionts like, like uh, Bacteria fragilis. In our laboratory, we've studied pathobionts, organisms that drive inflammation but still live in healthy people as well. And uh, what we've shown is that these pathobionts have discrete mechanisms by which they induce inflammation, but they, only, but they don't uh, cause disease as long as they're in balance with the symbionts. So the new concept here is that perhaps disease can be caused by this imbalance. In other words, if there's a decrease in symbiotic organisms, if organisms like Bacteria fragilis are reduced or completely eliminated from the gut, or that there's an overgrowth of these pathobionts, then that can tip the balance towards inflammation, either in the gut or in the central nervous system, as I mentioned, or even elsewhere in the body, and that could drive disease. And once again, the difference between this, this line of reasoning versus conventional wisdom is that we're not studying pathogens at all. So um, things like the flu or strep throat or even HIV, these are infectious agents that come from the, from the environment and cause disease, whereas in the, the concept that, that we, we believe drives inflammatory bowel disease, there is no external agent. So I want to make sure that I emphasize that inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, and many other autoimmune and allergic diseases have a genetic component. So there are clearly host genetics that play a role in inflammatory bowel disease, and these are some of the genes that are involved in IBD. But polymorphisms, which means changes from the norm in, in these genes, appear to be found pretty widespread in, in the population. For example, this gene NOD2 is the highest, um, uh, mutations of NOD2 is the highest risk factor for inflammatory bowel disease, but it's carried in 30% of the population, and clearly 30% of the population doesn't have inflammatory bowel disease. So it looks like there's at least two different events that may go into or may cause um, the manifestations of disease. First of all, there's a susceptible genetic landscape, but secondly, through modern um, uh, practices, through changes in our diet, through antibiotic use, as I mentioned, the way we're born in hospitals in very, very clean settings, and, um, and even uh, uh, hygiene and vaccination, that these events can change our gut microbiome, can change the proportions of the organisms in our intestine, and really drive dysbiosis, which is this alteration in the community composition of bacteria. And as I've mentioned, since certain organisms are pro-inflammatory, if the balance is tipped towards inflammation, towards these, these pro-inflammatory T cells, then that can drive disease. However, if this biosis um, is, is either corrected or doesn't occur in the first place, then regulatory T cells prevent these pro-inflammatory uh, T cells from inducing inflammation. So I think that the, the new um, uh, concept here is that our immune system functions based on, on inputs or signals from our microbiome. So the balance between those or, the organisms in our intestine affect the immune profile throughout the body. And so it's become apparent in the last um, 40 or 50 years that in Western developed societies, um, the rates of infection and inflammatory, or rates of infection and infectious diseases have dramatically increased. And this is for the reasons that I told you, is that we have widespread antibiotic use and vaccination and hygiene in, in the United States. And in fact, by and large, we don't have to uh, worry too much about many infectious diseases, many of these life-threatening infectious diseases that affect the developing world. And I think, in fact, the control of infectious diseases may be one of the greatest advances of, 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 uh, of medicine in the 20th century. But at the same time, there's a disturbing trend. And this is uh, a correlation. We don't know if there's a cause or effect relationship here. But at the same time, non-infectious, immune-mediated diseases seem to be on the increase. So I told you about Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis, but diseases like type 1 diabetes, asthma, and many other allergic and autoimmune diseases seem to be increasing in the same time frame. And so it's tempting to speculate that as we've tried to distance ourselves from infectious agents, we've changed our association with microbes as a whole, with the entire microbial world. And in fact, most microbes are not infectious. Most of the microbes that we come in contact with do not cause disease. And as I mentioned, we have at least 10,000, or it appears to be 10,000 microbes that live in our bodies. And only about 50 or 60 um, uh, microbes or, or bacteria are known to be pathogenic or infectious. And so, once again, in our attempts to, to um, 
uh, cure infectious diseases, perhaps we've disassociated ourselves from organisms like Bacteria fragilis. And the price to pay for that is the absence of regulation, the absence of these regulatory T cells, and the increase in autoimmune and allergic diseases. And in fact, in animal models, it's known that Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, um, type 1 diabetes, and asthma have a very, very strong regulatory T cell component to them. And so we've been doing this work, uh, as Steve mentioned, since, since uh, 2006. And um, we, we were really focused on, on the immune system, once again, for the obvious reasons that microbes interact with the immune system. However, what we've shown is that those interactions can be quite unique and different than those of an infection. But it became apparent uh, a few years ago to us that many of the um, features of the immune system are shared with the nervous system. And so uh, many of us uh, know about neurotransmitters, and these are molecules of the nervous system, which um, are how neurons or, or, or uh, uh, cells of the nervous system communicate with each other. It appears that neurotransmitters are sensed by immune cells and produced by immune cells. And so you may have also heard of cytokines. I mentioned a few cytokines. Uh, cytokines are believed to be immune molecules, but many, molecule, many cells of the, of the nervous system also produce cytokines. And in fact, it's known that immune cells and neurons actually synapse. They actually come together and, and talk to each other. And so this, you know, once again, though conceptual, made us believe that if microbes can interact with the immune system, then perhaps they can interact with the nervous system as well. And perhaps there was an interaction between gut microbes, microbes living in the intestine, and the brain. And so a few years ago, uh, in collaboration with my good friend Paul Patterson, we set out to understand whether or not gut bacteria affected neurological disorders. And in fact, we focused on autism. Recently, we've been working on neurodege neurodegeneration, but I'm going to tell you about our findings in uh, mouse models of autism. So as, as you may know, autism um, is a spectrum of diseases. It's uh, commonly known as, as AST or, or autism spectrum disorders. And autism affects 1.3 million Americans and many others worldwide. And autism is currently diagnosed by three core behavioral deficits. Deficits in social interaction, language and communication, and re repetitive stereotype behavior. And so once again, these core features um, uh, are, are important in the diagnosis of autism, are critical in the diagnosis of autism. But in addition to these core behavioral deficits, there are a set of other poly, uh, um, comorbidities or endophenotypes. These are symptoms that are associated with autism as well. And as you can see, immune dysfunction is a very um, important one. And so it's, there are many studies showing that the immune system of autistic subjects is quite, is quite altered. And in fact, and we'll talk about this some more, but gastrointestinal symptoms seem to be quite prevalent in autistic subjects. And there are reports showing that up to 70%, if not more, of autistic uh, children have some form of GI uh, disorder. This is not inflammatory bowel disease. They don't have the severe symptoms of a patient with Crohn's disease, but they do have gastrointestinal involvement. And then they also have uh, other, other uh, comor comorbidities, such as seizures or anxiety. And so, once again, I think uh, it's become clear that autism is a spectrum of disorders, and uh, treating any one of these symptoms, uh, I believe, will, will provide benefits to subjects with autism. The other similarity to the immune uh, diseases that I told you about is that the rates of autism and the diagnosis of autism appears to be increasing. And so this is data from, um, originally from the Centers for Disease Control, and it was funded by Autism Speaks that shows uh, as of 2008 or 2009 that one in 110 children uh, are diagnosed with autism in the United States. And in fact, this number has increased in the past few years. And so there was a subsequent report showing that the rate was one in 88. And then a report came out last week demonstrating that the rates of autism in this country are now one in 68 new births. And so clearly, in a very, very short period of time, the rate of autism, at least the diagnosis of autism, has increased. And I believe that because of that, of that short window, that genetics, by and large, can't explain the increase in autism, right? because our DNA, our genomes, don't mutate that quickly. Once again, I, I do believe genetics does have a, a role in autism, but it can't explain this, this dramatic increase. <clears throat> 
And so autism is a major problem and, and a growing problem in the, in the United States and in most developed countries. Uh, reporting in the developing world is, is still unknown, but clearly um, this, uh, this is an area of, of great interest. And so what Paul did several years ago is uh, used, um, what he used was uh, epidemiologic data to develop animal models of autism. And in fact, once again, as I mentioned, there are, there are clearly genetic mutations, and there are clearly genetic predispositions to autism, and here are some of the genes that have been associated with ASD. But if you add up all of the, the um, um, uh, subjects that have uh, these uh, mutations in these genes, it only accounts for about 15% of the autistic population, which suggests that perhaps there are many more genes still waiting to be discovered, or there's a very important uh, and a very strong environmental component to autism. And in fact, there has been shown that certain chemicals during pregnancy can cause, uh, or the, the ingestion of certain chemicals during pregnancy can increase the rates of autism. And in fact, infections during pregnancy are also a risk factor for autism. And this is the data that Paul used to develop uh, the mouse model that I'll tell you about in a few minutes. But the data, the original data comes um, from several studies, um, one showing in 1964 after the rubella pandemic that the rates of autism increased dramatically in the offspring of, of mothers who were pregnant during the, during the pandemic. And in fact, in large epidemiologic studies, both in Denmark and in Stockholm County in Sweden, where about 10,000 families were followed, Mothers who had very severe infections during pregnancy were much more likely to have an autistic child than mothers who did not have a severe infection. And so I'm not talking about a common cold, so there's no reason for, for concern. Um, but these are very severe infections, usually associated with, with uh, severe fevers and with hospitalization. And the rates of, of autism increased something uh, close to sevenfold in those mothers during the first or second trimester that have a very severe um, um, uh, activation of their immune system. And so what Paul did was he modeled this, this epidemiologic data in mice. And the way he set up this model was that he took animals and in mid-gestation either uh, gave them a flu infection and, and uh, injected them with influenza, or a viral mimic, and this is what we use now, a molecule called poly-IC, which activates the immune system in a way very, very similar to the flu. And so once again, when, when these, when these um, uh, pregnant mothers are injected with, with influenza or poly-IC, their offspring develop symptoms of autism. And those symptoms are both behavioral and neuropathologic. So as I mentioned, there are three core behaviors associated with autism impaired social interaction, decreased communication, and repetitive stereotype behavior are all modeled in these mice. In addition, these mice show, show anxiety as well as sensory motor gating deficits. And so those are the behavioral um, ramifications of, of uh, maternal immune activation. But in addition to these behaviors, there are specific neuropathologies in this mouse model which are also shared in humans. So post-mortem brains that have been studied from autistic subjects show deficits in certain uh, cell types, as well as uh, delayed migration as, and, different, and deficits in neurotransmitter signaling. And so we think that this is a, a very powerful model for autism. And I won't go into the data, but we've actually tested some of our hypotheses in additional models as well. So the first thing we did with this model was to ask whether or not there was a change in the microbiome or the community composition of the bacteria, similar to what was shown in inflammatory bowel disease. And in fact, um, uh, data from humans had suggested that subjects with autism had different microbiomes than the best match controls. So what we did was we compared the microbiomes of animals that were either treated with uh, a vehicle, the control, which is in this case saline, or with poly-IC. And so what you're looking at here is a mathematical algorithm that assigns a, a, a specific coordinate to the microbiome of each mouse. For example, each of these symbols is an animal. And what we've done is we've profiled the thousand or so species that are found in, in the intestines of these animals and look at the relative proportions and then assign a mathematical value to them. And as you can see, the animals that um, are healthy, the animals that were injected just with saltwater saline, all group here, 
whereas the animals that were injected with poly-IC, which is a viral mimic, seem to have a very different microbiome. And so we asked ourselves, if the microbiome of these animals are different, can we correct that microbiome and presumably correct the behavioral um, effects of autism? And so we turned to Bacteria's fragilis because, as I mentioned, Bacteria's fragilis has very powerful effects on restoring the, the gastrointestinal uh, deficits in mouse models of inflammatory bowel disease, and wondered whether IBD or, or whether uh, Bacteria's fragilis would correct this dysbiosis. And indeed, when we treated animals that were induced for autism with Bacteria's fragilis, you could see that their microbiomes were almost uh, completely protected or altered and restored back to normal. And so this was, um, I think, a wonderful triumph in our ability to target uh, a symptom of autism, in this case, a microbial symptom of autism, by, by uh, treating the animals with a single probiotic. And so I wanted to show you uh, some of the symptoms of anxiety. And so we'll watch uh, an anxious mouse. And, and what we're going to uh, try and understand is, is how can we model anxiety in an animal? Right? So you just looked at a visual representation of an anxious mouse. But what we do in the laboratory is we have um, uh, an apparatus that allows us to, to, to specifically uh, quantitate how much anxiety an animal feels. And so when we put a mouse in an arena, so this is, this is um, a, 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 an apparatus that we use, where we put a single mouse into a cage and we ask, how often does that mouse enter the center and how long does it spend in the center of that cage? And the reason why we do this is that mice are generally very timid because mice, as you know, are, or, or you may know, are nocturnal. They're always worried about predators and so they're, they're very skittish. And when you put an animal in, in this arena, they tend to stay near the corners. But an animal that is um, more bold or more daring will enter the center of the arena. And so the center of the arena is marked by this blue box. And so we have a camera overlooking the, overlooking the, the uh, arena. And we can ask how often and how long do, does a mouse spend in the center of this, uh, of this cage? And so as you can see, the saline animals or the control animals spend more time than animals induced with poly-IC. So they enter the, the, the um, arena more often, and once again, they spend more time in the center of the arena than animals that were induced for autism. And you can see that comparing the black bars to the white bars. But once again, if we take these animals, the animals that are induced for autism with poly-IC, and now feed them bacteria fragilis, as you can see, their ability to, or the time, the amount of uh, entries into the center, as well as their duration in the center, is uh, normalized or corrected simply by feeding these animals uh, 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 one single bacteria. And I have to mention once again, Bacteria fragilis is a human isolate, and we're giving it to mice in this case, and the mice are responding favorably, and we're in essence treating their anxiety. So as I mentioned, mice have compulsive behavior, and we test this through marble burying assays. And so as you can see, a mouse is quite playful, and if he sees a marble, the mouse will bury that marble. <laughs> but autistic mice have more extreme behaviors, and once they see one marble, they'll bury it, and they'll bury the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And this is this repetitive stereotype behavior that I mentioned. So once again, we can model this in real mice, not just in cartoon mice. And so the way we do this is we take an animal and we put it into a cage where the bedding, which is, which is what the animals um, uh, walk on, are lined with marbles. And in a given amount of time, we measure how many marbles a, a mouse will bury. And so once again, if a mouse has this compulsive behavior, it should bury more marbles. And indeed they do. So these are, once again, the control saline injected animals. And then these are the poly-IC injected animals. And the animals uh, injected with this viral mimic show an increase in the percentage of marbles buried in a given amount of time. And once again, when the, the uh, animals that were induced for autistic behavior are treated orally with Bacteria fragilis, then they're reduced in their, in their compulsive behavior, and they show relatively normal um, abilities in terms of repetitive and stereotype behaviors. And so we can correct this symptom of autism as well. 
As I mentioned, the other core behavior, uh, behavioral deficit in autism is communication, is verbalization. And so this is a little trickier to measure in an animal. And so uh, what we do here is that we have a microphone that can pick up ultrasonic vocalizations. And so in essence, you, some of you may have heard a mouse squeal. That's, that's not communication in the mouse. A mouse. Mice communicate to each other at the ultrasonic wavelength. And so we have a, a camera system where we can put a male mouse with a female mouse and essentially uh, eavesdrop on this animal, on this male, courting the female. And if uh, this plays, I will let you listen to how a male mouse identifies its mate. So these are what we believe to be sentences and syllables that the mouse is using. Okay. And so once again, we can measure the, the, um, the um, uh, communication between a male mouse and a female mouse, and we can measure both the number of calls and the duration of those calls. And as you can see, in this case, an autistic animal, similar to an autistic human, vocalizes less. And here you see that the poly I see, autistic animals both uh, call fewer and they spend less time during their calls. And once again, animals that were treated with bacteria aspergillus are normalized for vocalization. And so we can, we can restore this core behavior of autism. And so just to summarize what, what we've uh, done in animals so far. So we take the, uh, the fearful animal, we feed it a probiotic, which they love. <laughs> and now the mouse is normal. Okay. And at the end of the day, we have a, a, a facility full of happy animals. Okay. So ultimately, to try and understand what, it, what is the mechanism behind how targeting the gut with a bacterium affects behaviors that are presumably regulated in the brain. We wanted to understand what the molecular mechanism was for communication between the gut and the brain. And as I mentioned, there are multiple studies showing that children with autism have gastrointestinal deficits. And so this, the, the, the major symptom that has been reported in autistic children is that they have a, a syndrome called leaky gut, or permeability of the barrier of the intestine. And this is important because the, the gut has a very, very unique um, uh, property and function is it's supposed to keep harmful things out while letting nutrients in. But if the gut is leaky, if there's some sort of a deficit in the ability of this barrier to perform its function, then harmful, sub, uh, uh, harmful compounds can leak across the gut and get into the circulation. And so this is um, uh, a phrase from, from uh, a study that looked at multiple different original articles and then this consortium concluded that leaky gut or permeability of the intestine was a major feature in autistic children. And so we hypothesized that perhaps this change in the microbiome that I showed you uh, in these autistic animals, combined with the leaky gut, allows molecules that were meant to stay in the intestine to leak into the circulation, presumably get into the brain, and cause behavioral deficits. And so this was the hypothesis that we wanted to test. And at the same time that we were testing this hypothesis, there was a, a wonderful study that showed that, that, in fact, leakiness of molecules across the gut was a major factor in atherosclerosis. And so I'll take you through this quite quickly, and this is, once again, just a proof of concept that gut microbial molecules can affect diseases through metabolites or through, through microbial products. And so once again, this has now become a, a, a famous story showing that the ingestion of phosphatidylcholine, which is a, a compound found in many, many foods, is converted to choline and then to, to trimethylamine by gut bacteria. And so what these gut bacteria do is they transform or they change molecules that we eat to other molecules, right? And in this case, what happens is this choline conversion to TMA leaks across the gut and then in the liver is, is uh, converted to trimethylamine oxide. And trimethylamine oxide is a very toxic agent, 
And in fact, it gets into the plaques of the arteries and it actually, it actually causes atherosclerosis. And so we wondered if a similar um, event was occurring in animals, but in this case, instead of causing atherosclerosis, was causing behavioral deficits uh, consistent with autism. So in fact, we did notice leaky gut in these animals. So when we look inside, we see that the, the uh, uh, gut is permeable, and in fact, there's a buildup of these toxic molecules. And when we treated these animals with Bacterius fragilis, there's our good guy. <laughs> the leakiness was repaired. And once again, the mouse is happy. All right, so then to test this and, and to really understand the chemical entity that, that, that um, was mediating this phenotype, Paul and I looked at the serum metabolome of both healthy um, and autistic animals, as well as animals that were treated with Bacteria fragilis. And the way we did this was we looked in the blood and we did a full uh, analysis of all the chemicals that were found in the blood of these, these three different groups of animals. We looked at thousands of different metabolites, and, there, and though many of them were changed, one of these molecules stood out, and that's a molecule called 4-ethylphenyl sulfate. This was a molecule that was, uh, that was quite newly discovered. It was only described in 2010. Very little is known about its biology. But it's clear that there is a level of 4-ethylphenyl sulfate in normal animals. And in fact, the original paper that described 4-ethylphenyl sulfate predicted that this molecule is made by gut bacteria. And so we detected a low level in normal mice. Um, and once again, normal mice don't have leaky gut. But in an autistic mouse, which has permeability of its intestine, we identified that there were much higher levels of this molecule of 4 ethylphenyl sulfate. But once again, when we fed these animals back to fragilis, when we treated them with the probiotic, that level was reduced back to normal. And in fact, this told us a lot about uh, perhaps the chemical com communication between gut bacteria and molecules that can cause um, uh, neurobehavioral deficits. And so finally, we wanted to know, what, is this a cause or an effect? And so once again, measuring uh, the levels of a molecule uh, that are associated with these symptoms may be a diagnostic, or perhaps 4 sulfate was driving behavioral deficits itself. In other words, its increased levels in the mice that showed uh, autistic behaviors may be because of the high levels of 4 sulfate. And so what we did is we took uh, animals, completely naive, healthy animals, and we injected them with 4 ethyl sulfate. And what we, dis what we sh uh, showed was that animals, once again, naive, healthy animals, that were injected with 4 ethyl sulfate entered the center of this arena and spent less time in, in the center of this arena compared to animals that were, that were treated with vehicle control. In other words, this particular compound was sufficient to induce anxiety in mice which is once again uh, a related symptom of autism. And so as I mentioned, there are many other uh, compounds that we have not yet studied, and perhaps different combinations of these compounds can, can recapitulate many of the different disorders or many of the, the, the different symptoms that, are, that result in autism. And this is something that we're, we're pursuing. And in fact, Paul and I are now looking in human serum from patients with autism and controls to see if, if 4 phenyl sulfate is a signal uh, for autism, if we can use this as a diagnostic, and we're trying to identify ways of inhibiting 4-ethyl sulfate um, and its activities as a therapy for anxiety and perhaps other behavioral deficits as well. And so the model that, that comes from these studies are that um, in animals and presumably in humans um, with autism, that there's dysbi originally there's dysbiosis or this change in the community composition of gut bacteria comparing uh, autistic children to, to um, even siblings or to uh, typically developing children, it's clear that their gut microbiomes are different. And these changes in, in gut microbiomes result in an overgrowth of organisms that may be producing molecules such as 4 ethyl sulfate. So now you have this buildup of toxic molecules in the gut. But at the same time, as I showed you, there's a defect in the barrier integrity of these animals. So there's the syndrome called leaky gut where the junctions between the epithelial cells, which line the, the intestine, are, are porous. And these chemicals can, can travel between the cells and into the circulation. And if molecules like 4 sulfate get into the circulation, presumably they can get into the brain, 
and then they can cause behavioral deficits. And the therapy for this presumably neurologic or behavioral deficit, at least in animals, is a gut bacterium. In other words, we can target the gut and have uh, uh, beneficial effects in the brain. And once again, the way we believe this works is that by introducing bacteria fragilis, we can correct dysbiosis, correct the leakiness of the epithelium, and this results in fewer of these uh, toxic molecules getting into the circulation and, uh, and affecting brain um, function. And so to conclude, I think that, that many disorders, many neurological disorders, which have been classically studied by neuroscientists as disorders of the brain, may in fact be disorders of the gastrointestinal system. And I think this is, in many ways, heresy to, to, in neuroscience, but I think that this, this data at least suggests that it's a possibility. And in fact, leaky gut has been associated with Parkinson's disease and with Alzheimer's. And so perhaps m diseases other than autism share this relationship between the gut and the brain. And as I mentioned, the way we treat um, many of these disorders th today are with chemicals and pills and, and um, different uh, avenues that don't have the rigorous science that, that I've demonstrated here. Once again, the caveat being that th this research is still only in mouse models. And presumably, the ability to target the gut and access the brain is going to be a much easier pr uh, uh, prospect than neurological than, uh, chemicals that would target brain regions themselves. And in fact, for certain disorders, such as Parkinson's, things like deep brain stimulation or the, the um, injection of, or the implantation of electrodes into the brain is a last line therapy for, for Parkinson's. And if we can access the brain through the gut, I think we've made a huge progress in uh, ameliorating these symptoms and doing so in a way that's both safe and effective. And so I'll conclude by leaving you with a choice of how you want to live the rest of your lives. <laughs> And hopefully I've convinced you that microbes are not evil, that many of them are in fact beneficial and have remarkable and fascinating effects on, on our biology and presumably we can harness these effects as, as novel therapeutics. And so uh, the most important slide of all, these are the people who did the work and I have to thank both Elaine Sow and June Round for really driving the studies that I told you about. Elaine is an incredibly talented former graduate student who's now a senior research fellow here at Caltech. She was a graduate student with Paul Patterson, and she did all the autism work that I mentioned. June Round um, uh, was a former postdoc in the laboratory, and she studied PSA and its effects on inflammatory bowel disease. These are some of the other members of the laboratory, and I have to thank Sarah McBride and, and Gil Sharon for their um, involvement in the autism project. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, Paul Patterson is uh, more than a collaborator, more than a friend, but an inspiration. And he taught me everything I know about neuroscience. And so I have to thank Paul and, and his student, Sophia. Uh, Sarah Reisman, who Steve mentioned earlier, who's the next Watson uh, lecturer, was uh, a collaborator on this project because she produced 4-ethylphenyl sulfate for us. As I mentioned, this molecule was only discovered um, uh, about, about three or four years ago and it's not commercially available, so Sarah and her, and her graduate student, Jay, uh, synthesized this molecule for us. Joe Petrosino at Baylor did the microbiome profiling that I, that I showed you, and he identified this dysbiosis in the autistic animals. And finally, I have to thank Elaine again, as well as uh, Wes McBride, for their uh, help with some of the slides that I showed you. So I will stop there and be happy to take questions. Mm -hmm.